Welcome back to SoFlow TV. Again, everybody, it is your host with the most. Let me start this video off by saying this. A teacher, a teacher is one of the most essential workers on earth. Why? Because you have entrusted a human mind to this individual to help to mold it in ways that that individual will be affected for for their entire lives. That's how deep being a teacher is. I'm going to run you through this article first from the Jamaica Observer. A Jamaican educator who is set to return from the J1 teacher exchange program is bemoaning aspects of his experience, likening it to a pimp with prostitutes. Now, we've talked about brain draining before, right? But we are going to talk a little bit deeper today. Now, he said, how I see the program, there is a guy who wrote the book about being a pimp and how a pimp treats his lady. After five years, the pimp gets rid of his lady. For me, that's how I see it. I was one of those ladies who came, he told the Jamaica Observer. The sponsor earns at least 10,000 US dollars annually for our labor. Someone is saying, wow, right now. The sponsor, the person who brings them in, gets them the job, earns at least 10,000 US dollars annually off of their heads. I don't know how it works, but the district pays them annually for our harlotry, if you may. They bring you here, you work, and they're like the pimp. They collect off your head. The districts can pay them because we don't get what a regular American teacher gets. It costs the district far less to have us in the classroom than a regular American teacher. And they get more out of it than us. We don't get what a regular American teacher gets. And I'm supposing they're talking about like the full health benefits as well as other incentives like bonuses, so on and so forth. He said that in addition, the teacher said, Jamaica, Jamaicans are placed in the worst districts with the worst schools and no access to any form of reprieve when faced with difficult situations. I have been in the classrooms where Americans walk out and never came back, but I have to deal with those children. I have been in classrooms where students threaten me and other Jamaicans and nothing is done about it. The same week a student threatened me and an American and in less than 10 seconds, that student was removed from the American's classroom. I looked at that student every single day. You are pegged to a school district and you cannot leave the district after two years of being in the district, the educator shared. Wow. So basically what he's discussing here are work conditions. And he's saying that as a teacher, when they take you from Jamaica, which we are talking about the brain draining process, right? So as a teacher, when they take this, this would give uh, me an insight. If I wanted to be a teacher, go overseas in one of these work programs, would it deter me from going? I don't know, because sometimes we have to make great sacrifices in order to accomplish the things that we have set out, these goals we have in our minds, right? So I don't know how much I would be willing to go through to accomplish my goals, but if being a teacher and you want to go on this program, this would be a good insight. Or for those of us who are interested in the whole story, we just want to know what it feels like to be on that other side. And he's saying that I have been in the classrooms where Americans, Americans just walk out and they never come back. But I have to deal with those children. I have been in the classrooms where students threaten me and other Jamaicans, and nothing is done about it. So he's saying that you're a Jamaican teacher, and you're in the classroom, and you have Jamaican students in the classroom as well. American kids, they get up, they threaten you, they threaten the other Jamaicans in the classroom, and they walk out, or they just stay there. And you as a teacher, 
You complain about these threats and nothing is done about it. The same week, a student threatened me and an American, and in less than 10 seconds, that student was removed from the American's classroom. So, in other words, then, they are putting the pressure on you if you are imported for labor. And they're giving you the worst students, and they're taking all the chances with you. For instance, what they would tolerate from a student in an American classroom, say he did something, and he would be asked to leave right away or face disciplinary problems, disciplinary, uh, face discipline right away. For instance, take him to the teacher, take him to the uh, principal's office or remove him from the class totally. When it's your classroom, you're the imported teacher from Jamaica. When it's your classroom, that same unruly student is actually left in your classroom all day. And he's saying, you have, he had to look at that same student every single day. You are pegged to a school district and you cannot leave the school district after two years of being in the school district. Now, like I've said at the beginning of this, I know people personally that have been and some still are on involved in this program. The teacher added, I've been away for five years been away from Jamaica for five years. So you see, people go on these trips and it takes years to return home. Because after all, you want to work and earn a living and you want to get paid based on what it is you went to college for and you were spent all that money to get a degree in. You know what I'm saying? It's just a natural thing to do. He's been away for five years. I came here with a program sponsor who is horrible. He's telling his story now. The program does not look for the benefit of the teachers. Based on my observation, we were brought here to do the jobs that regular Americans wouldn't do for the little and nothing. The pay you get isn't to the standard. You don't get health benefits. I have to rely on a lot of home remedies when my child is ill because... You cannot walk into a hospital. You don't have that health coverage. They do not look for your best interest. So there's another part right there that would tell people that if you plan on going, taking the risk of going on this program, then try to find out if there's some way that they can write health care coverage into your packet. If it's even basic health care coverage, because... I can tell you living in the United States of America that health care is very expensive here. A trip to the hospital, to the doctor is very expensive here and they're going to want their money. So it's good to have some form. I can't imagine living five years under those conditions, but it is what it is, right? People live under worse. The teacher also spoke of intimidation and vindication experienced by sponsors when he and other colleagues tried to apply for the no objection statement to change their status from a J-1 visa to a H-1B. Two main sponsors work through Jamaica. I am with the worst one. Teacher affiliate. <laughs> now at this point, I wish, but this is for us to go and look up who are the two main sponsors, right? If there's even public information out there on who they are. Who are the two main sponsors that sponsor uh, teachers being exported? He said, I am with the worst one. I wish he had called names. Teachers affiliated with the other sponsor applied for the no objection letter and the sponsors weren't even bothered. My sponsor went out to withdraw the sponsorship and demand that you leave the country immediately. Based on my view and my view only, they use the exchange program in order to get us here as low income earners. Before I came here, they told me, look, you're not coming here to save. You're not coming here to work and send money back to Jamaica. You're coming here to work and spend money here. If I am looking tacky because I am trying to save, 
they will terminate the program. So they are not looking out for your best interest at all, the educator said. This is inside information a lot of people might need to know. So when you go on the program and you're going through these things, you could have said, well, I knew that was coming. And you can better prepare yourself, right? Because the program is an opportunity, regardless of what. It's an opportunity. And from that opportunity, you know how we say already in Jamaica, we take Likla Mecca whole lot. You know, so he's saying that based on his view, they use the exchange program in order to get us here as low income earners. And before he even came here, they told me, look, you're not coming here to save. You're not coming here to work and send money back to Jamaica. You're coming here to work and spend money here. If I am looking tacky because I am trying to save they will terminate the program. So you can't, you have to go buy nice clothes and always look clean and well presentable. Well, that's in any profession anyways, right? Or in most professions anyways, especially at that level. But can you imagine them telling you, the most Jamaicans that go overseas to work on work programs, the goal is to work and save and send money back home. So to be told that, look, you're not coming here to work and save. You're coming here to work and earn and spend money here. What? What? That would have been frightening for me after that because what else do you have in store for me? But again, we make sacrifices in order to accomplish goals. In relation to his decision to go through with the program, the teacher told the Sunday Observer that he chose to be a part of the program because he wanted to give his child something new. And we wanted a collaboration experience pertaining special education, which is his focus in education. Now, you see, I, I believe that through this program, he was also able to bring his family along with him. That is another incentive to the program where I'm not sure. But if it is, then you can see a loophole there that you can use to your advantage. So when people ask, so why people even bother going on these programs? Think about it. In Jamaica, you don't really get that special education experience as you do when you are here. You get to have meetings where you collaborate and create individual education programs, the IEP. Then you implement the IEP in the classroom. You do not really get that in Jamaica. While in Jamaica, the only time I have ever been called up for an IEP is when someone from the ministry walks in and says, I need to see the IEP. Apart from that, it is not really used. It is not really implemented. But you are taught in college that you prepare it just in case the ministry walks in. And that is freaking sad. Because y'all know, as I work in the field of occupational therapy, Right now, and for the past number of years, I have been in the geriatric side of occupational therapy, but I have also worked in the pediatric side, so I know very well what the IEP is. Standard in schools in the United States of America, for example. And these are the things that I say we can bring back home to make Jamaica better for generations to come. Check this out. In an average school in the United States of America, it is mandatory that a child that has certain what we call handicaps, right? Then these children can still go to a traditional school and sit in a classroom with their peers. And while they're in that classroom, an IEP is created for them. So they're not isolated at home. And they're not somewhere where people are saying, oh, um, in, in kind of retarded in or in don't, in, in, in some, you know, he has this or he has that. So he can't go to a regular school. These kids go to a regular school and there's a program there. Now, this man is saying that in Jamaica, from his experience, they're told from college that just prepare the IEP just in case the Ministry of Education passed through, but is not something we really use. You know what I'm saying? In Jamaica, you don't really get the special education experience. And it could not, it, it could be, special education just mean that 
the child needs probably needs more attention probably needs more working on probably needs help or somebody to sit beside them so they can stay still long enough to learn to redirect their attention because they have an attention deficit disorder it could be all kinds of stuff the IEP falls under I don't want you to think just like physically handicapped kind of a person right so as we move along apart from that it is not really used not implemented but you are taught in college that you prepare it just in case the ministry walks in and these are the things that I'm saying to be developed, put into each school, and put into action daily. Apart from that, it's not really used. But here, that is your daily life. You will get fired if you do not have it. That's how the students get services, and that's how the school gets their money from the federal government, he said. So there are incentives to using it. And maybe there are no incentives to using it in Jamaica. And that is the reason why no one worries about using it. Anyhow, the educator cautioned Jamaican teachers to not use the program if they are seeking money. Rather, it's best suited if a new experience is desired. In other words, they must say, if a money I look... Don't go on the program here because you won't be able to save any and then I'll go walk you out and make money off of you. If you are at the part of your career where you've experienced everything and you want something different, then yes, go ahead. If you are at the part of your career where you're stagnant and you want something new, yes, go ahead. If you are at the part of your career, he labeled all these. If you are at the part of your career where you are just seeking money, you cannot do the J-1 program because in Jamaica, you're looking at U.S. dollars. But when you are in the U.S., you are spending U.S. dollars. And in order for you to have a semblance of a comfortable life, you have to live in low-income communities. You are living with your students and these communities are not the best communities to live in because shots fire regularly in these communities. But you live in low income communities because the rent is cheap and that is the way how you're going to get to save a little something out of what you are earning. The teacher added, he said, in case we want to get into the money part of it, he said, you are getting 1200 or 1100 US dollars weekly. And of that money, you may have to pay 1200 or 1100 for your rent so to have a comfortable life you have to live somewhere where the rent is cheaper because you have to be able to afford car payments as well you have to maintain an insurance which the j1 program requires and that is health insurance and you don't so you have to independently purchase health insurance and you don't have a say when that insurance is taken from your salary when those ded deductions are taken from your salary at the end of the month you don't really have anything else so you have to look in these low income communities to live you also have to go and get a non-dependable car i'm in south carolina and in south carolina you do not get transportation it's not like in jamaica where you can roll up and get a taxi Yes, you could call for taxi, but the amount you spend for a week, your salary won't cover that. And that is true. There are places here where I go into remote areas on contract to do occupational therapy work. And I can tell you that some of these places are so far out, buses don't run out there. Public transportation does not run out there. The town might have one taxi. And first of all, it's going to take you forever for that one taxi to come. And then even if that one taxi comes, it's so far for you to go. The taxi fare is so much that it would be a dent. in You would probably just be working to pay for a taxi. And these are the locations you're put in and these kind of things. You know what I'm saying? So I can truly relate to what he's saying. Now, he said that they took more than five months to reply to me. And the process tells you that they're going to take up to 90 days. They took up to 150 days to reply to me. Further, 
Another aspect of the experience which has made things difficult is trying to obtain a no-objection statement from Jamaica to change his status from J-1 to H-1B. They took more than five months to reply to me, and the process tells you that they're going to take 90 days. They took up to 150 days to reply to me. You have to get that no objection statement before you could apply for the waiver. Before you can apply for the H-1B-1, I haven't heard anything from Ministry of Finance and in the process of calling around and talking to people, I had to communicate with student loan and for student loan to check student loan system and send a letter to the Ministry of Finance. It takes up to 14 more days. The reason mine was slowed is because I was a guarantor. My sister replaced me as guarantor and I thought, okay, now I am replaced. Can the letter be sent to the ministry? We were told it might take up to 14 days for the letter to be sent. It won't be sent until the ministry has requested it. They are not moving with our interests, he said. Subsequently, the educator has made plans to return in order to not run afoul of the law. As the letter shows, you I have to return and I have to return by the end of June or mess any possibility up. We have booked our flights, he said, him and his family. The pending return has also left the educator anxious. We are anxious simply because of my child. He does not know anything as it relates to Jamaica. So now they're having to come back to Jamaica to live. And that child, he's saying, I, I ha doesn't know anything as it relates to Jamaica. He came here pretty young. Most of his school life is done here. Jamaica is different as it relates to schooling. In Jamaica, you have taxi to get to school. Here, we had the car. We drove him. We don't know what to expect. We have been monitor monitoring the news and the news doesn't sound pleasing from our perspective. There's no job coming home to. I'm trying to collaborate and reach out to persons I know, but the country is just waking up per se. We are just looking and I am putting out fielders to see what could happen, he said. More while, there are sour points in his experience, the teacher said overall. There were positives. The experience is rewarding. As I can speak to how an IEP meeting should happen. I can write an IEP in my sleep. I know what's legal and what isn't. If you're going to go, do your research. There are good sponsors and then there are bad sponsors, he said. So, I like the fact that he's talking about now... Although he went through all those bad experiences, there are good experiences as well. Because for the fact that he was made to use an IEP, write and implement an IEP daily, now he can actually do it in his sleep. And this is something that is required by uh, the education board in Jamaica, but it is also something that within the school institution, they only pull it out when the Ministry of Education is on the scene to check up, to inspect, to see what I want. So him bringing that experience back and being so fluent with it, understand how an IEP meeting should happen, write to IEP in my sleep and I know what's legal and what isn't now, he can now bring this experience back. The sad part about this, which ain't really sad, it's just one of the bumps in the road that we've talked about before, like for instance, they're going back home after five years. That child probably left Jamaica at one. That child is now five or one. That child is now six. I'm, I'm saying the child don't know much about Jamaica, but the child is still young enough to be okay once you provide that child with a safe environment to learn and grow. And there are places in Jamaica where you can provide your family with a safe environment to learn and grow. The whole, the whole island is not exploding. Okay. Now, the part where he said it's rough going back and not going back to a job and the, the anxieties now because you've been away for a while. You're used to a certain type of life now over a five-year period. You jump in a car and drive everywhere you want to go. Now you're going back to Jamaica. You don't even have a car, right? 
probably weren't able to save a lot of money because like he said, they told him from the get-go and he is lamenting that, hey, this ain't what you got to do or what, this, this is not what you want to do if money or saving money is what you're about. Me never get to save none because he labeled all the things that came out of your check, how much you got paid and how it broke down and all that. It is what it is at this point. The funny part is they don't want to sign off on him being able to change his status because if he was, then I guess that would lengthen his time here and he could actually go to work in the United States of America as a teacher without being a part of that program and would be able to probably get what teachers get here as opposed to what imported teachers get. I hope that provided some insight to a lot of y'all, if you know anybody out there that's on a farm work program and they have shared some of these experiences with you, then go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section below or pass this on to someone you know who is probably a teacher and getting ready to get into a program or is, exper or is expressing interest in a program. Pass this video on to them. And if you want to read the entire article, you can find that entire article in the Gleaner and it's titled Jamaican Teacher Likens U.S. Exchange Program to Pimp with Prostitutes. Leave your comments in the comment section below. It's SoFlow TV. I'm out. Peace.